Well, hello and welcome to another online Bible study. Uh, I'm Pastor Bill Brown. Glad that you're here with us. We are going to be talking today. In fact, I am. I work in the art of fashion. That's the title of my sermon, The Art of Fashion. No, I'm not talking about the world's designers of the most beautiful clothes. I'm talking about something radically different than that. I'm talking about that fashion that's found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where we read, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That phrase that's used right at the very beginning here of verse 2 is what I want to be able to look at. That's where my title is drawn from, be not conform to this world. Um, the conjunction and ties it to what had been previously stated in verse 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. But even there in verse 1, there is another conjunction that you may have noticed where it says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So because of that presentation of the doctrine of justification by faith that's already been given to them in all of those previous chapters, Paul is now turning to the practical. It, this is the standard of living. And so he's saying on top of presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, He's saying, stop letting the fashions of your age fasten you. The word, uh, or the word world there is the word age. And of course, for any of us, it's translatable by whatever the uh, ideas of the world are. Instead of letting the fashions of the age fasten you, let the Bible transfigure you. Uh, that's the word that we get metamorphosis from. Um, really, it's almost spelled word for word. So the idea is since you have been born again, since you have been made a new creature, since you have been made a new man, stop letting the world fashion you. Be what you actually are a new man, a new creation, and let your transformation or your metamorphosis be revealed so that you might prove the right fashion comes from God and from his word. You see, the Bible is more than an intellectual library. It is full of truth that transforms. The perfect art of fashion is the will of God. Let the Bible be your rule of faith and practice, and you'll always be in fashion with God. Now, from that, those two verses, we're going to be looking at the plea, the presentation, the peculiarity, the procedure, and then the proving. That's our outline for this evening. I want to look first at the plea. I beseech you, therefore, I personally make a call to you, or really this is a personal close-up plea. I am pleading, I am urging you. Now, this is, of course, directed to the church at Rome. Uh, it's written directly to them. But because its author is divine, because this is the inspired word of God, it's also directed and made applicable to us. But before we look at this personal plea, I want you to realize 
What word the apostle did not use when he was writing this? He did not use the word command. I command you, therefore. Now, the word translated command is used some 12 times in the New Testament. In Paul's writing, it's used only five times. Give you an illustration of how it's used, 1 Corinthians 7 and 10. And under the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So what is the command? The Lord says, let not the wife depart from her husband. I'm not going to get into all of the details here, but the, it's interesting that the word command um, is used only five times where the word beseech that we just saw is used some 23 times and Paul says I beseech 13 times we beseech four different particular times he's using I guess you could say look at how he is using his authority as an apostle he is not commanding but he's pleading he's exhorting even if you will in a sense of begging Paul is pleading with the church of Rome to present their physical bodies as a living sacrifice. No command, none at all. What does he say? He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So I'm pleading with you. I'm begging with you. If you go on through how many times, in fact, it's so interesting that Paul uses so little times the idea of commanding and instead beseeching. For instance, in Romans 15 and 30, he pleads with the church at Rome to pray for him with, uh, and with him that, those, that he might be delivered from them who do not believe in Judea. In Romans 16 and 17, he pleads with the church there to mark them which cause divisions among you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 he pleads or beseeches the brethren by the name of Jesus Christ that you what? That you speak the same thing, that there be no divisions, so on. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 16, he says, I beseech you to be followers of me. I plead with you to be followers of me. And uh, further on in verses 15 and 16, he said, or 16, verses 15 and 16, he pleads with them to submit themselves to those who are addicted to the ministry, to those who have the right attitude and the right uh, uh, desire. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8, he says, I beseech that ye would confirm your love toward him. This is talking about the man who had been excluded. And here, what is Paul saying? Once this man comes back and repents and shows you that he's re repented, I beseech you, I plead with you that confirm your love towards him. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, he pleads, he says, begs, he says, as though God did beseech you by us to be reconciled to God. In 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1, he pleads with them as co-laborers or laborers together with God. In 2 Corinthians 9 and 5, he pleads with them about giving to the saints at Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1, he says, Now I, am Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He doesn't command. He, he's talking about receiving his apostleship and his directives. And he's pleading with him, not commanding them. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Are you getting the picture? How often that he pleads? 1 Thessalonians 2.11, he pleads, charges them, he says, uh, as a father does his children. There's pleading, there's commanding, of course. In a letter to Timothy, he pleads to, with him to pray for and be thankful to all men, to plead uh, and exhorting him 
uh, as a motivation to do so with all long suffering, he says. He tells Titus to plead or to exhort using sound doctrine. Again, Paul is pleading and he's using a motivation which is the mercies of God. Instead of commanding these justified, sanctified, and glorified saints or sinners, he pleads with them based on how that God has justified them by faith without the works of the law. Look at all that he has done for you. Everything in uh, Romans chapter 1 up through to the end of chapter 11. And he's saying, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God. Then the presentation. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do what? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. God has already sanctified you. God, in essence, has already, in substance, really, has already glorified you. He's sanctified you. He's justified you. He's glorified you by his determinate factor. He's made you a new creature. Now it's time for you to present your bodies, the whole you, body, soul, and mind, the same way as we see in the Old Testament of giving God the whole body soul and mind but he also says present your bodies a living sacrifice not a dead motionless immovable sacrifice but an active constantly submissive constantly serving spirit sanctified and divinely satisfying sacrifice you see the world has a selfish body with a self-determined and self-interest. The world loves self and it's not interested in being selfless as was Christ. The world loves darkness rather than light because its deeds are evil. But we need to crucify the flesh, but we also need to see the flesh raised up to walk in newness of life. We need to walk in love. We need to walk in light as he is in the light. Remember that we were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You've been justified, sanctified, and in God's providential plan, you are already glorified. So by these great mercies, you ought to present your bodies a living, active, holy sacrifice unto the Lord. That's in keeping with the Old Testament offerings. And when they were brought, it's talked about how that they were a sweet smelling savor. They talk about that in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, the whole ram burnt on the altar was a sweet smelling sacrifice. Well, you presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice will be a sweet smelling savor unto God. You and I are a spiritual house. We are a holy priesthood which can, by the mercies of God, offer up spiritual sacrifices. These are sacrifices that are superior to those literal, physical, outward offerings of the Old Testament. All those Old Testament, those were illustrations. They were shadows of the real substance. Peter tells us that you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are a spiritual house, a spiritual people who can offer superior spiritual sacrifices. Oh, amen to the presentation. Present yourself. A living sacrifice then the peculiarity he says that you and I in the peculiarity we are not to be conformed to this world or to this age be not conformed to this age now I already mentioned this at the beginning of my message 
But this goes together with verse 1 again. On top of presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, you are to stop letting the fashions of your age fashion you. Remember that? Let the Bible transfigure you. Let the Bible be your source of metamorphosis or your source of transformation. This isn't about clothing. This is about character. This isn't about our clothes, but it's about our course. Even though we're talking about, and Paul does elsewhere, about putting on the new man and putting off the old man, he, he talks about it in Ephesians, how that we used to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Don't be conformed to this world's love. Don't be conformed to this world's religion. Don't be conformed to this world's ideals. They're all temporary. They're all untrustworthy. They're all vain. And they all entangle. The devil. And I, I like this. I read it in one fellow's, and I don't remember who it was, but I appreciated his comment. He talked about the devil tries to rope you into his scheme. That's that word, don't be conformed into his scheme. Instead, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's the peculiarity. Now here's the procedure. The procedure, do not be conformed to this world, but do what? But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed or roped into the devil's schemes. Instead, you need to be transformed or have that metamorphosis take place. Let yourself be altered by the word of God, by the renewing of your mind through the word of God. This is the same instruction that Paul uses when he wrote to the church of Ephesus and also wrote to the church of Colossia about, again, putting off the old man and putting on the new man. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24, he, he really does say this, let yourself be altered. Notice that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This is saying the same thing. Let your life be altered by God, not by the world. That's why he's talking about letting your new man. That's the metamorphosis. That's the change. The fact that God has changed you that he has changed your way of thinking. You have a new heart, a new mind. You have new eyes, new ears. Then begin to act like that. Be renewed by gaining a greater revelation of Jesus Christ through his word and his thinking by experiencing a consistent walk with Christ, through Christ, and in Christ. As we walk with him, as we bring everything and every thought into obedience unto him, we'll prove that out. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing it to captivity. Notice this. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, the world's thinking exalts itself against the person of Christ. It exalts itself against the knowledge of God. But the Spirit exalts the person of Christ who obeyed every single word that came from the mouth of God. Paul repeats the same procedure at the end of his letter where he says that we ought not to make any provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Then lastly, let me give you the proving. Again, that we go back into our text here, be not conformed to this world, 
but ye, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is the progress of the Christian life. The word prove here means to put to the proof. It means find out by experience that God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. Instead of being involved in self-gratification, a renewed mind is going to be involved in self-denial. The will of God is discovered by those who refuse to be conformed to the age in which we live. And when the spiritual mind is altered by the mind and thinking of Christ discovered in the word of God, a yielded will is a discovering will. May we fulfill the will of God without the benefit of knowing and enjoying the will of God. Oh, yes, we can. We may fulfill the will of God without benefit of knowing and enjoying even enjoying doing the will of God, but we are certain to know the will of God. And we are certain to prove it to be the will of God and enjoy it as the will of God when we are translated by the mind of Christ. I hope that made sense to you. The will of God is good, perfect, and acceptable. And once we have the mind of Christ, that is how we will see the will of God as it is revealed to us. Prove it to yourself. Prove it to others by denial of self and a consistent commitment to the thinking of Christ that you can find in the Bible. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye metamorphosed. Be changed, be altered by the renewing of your mind from Christ, from the word of God, that you may prove to yourself and to others what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. May the Lord bless you. I hope that you've been blessed by the art of fashion as found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and verse 2. Lord bless you.